The reading of God's Word. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on all the armor of God, and you will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, apply all the armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the, in the evil day. And having done all of this, stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given, by the gospel of peace. In every circumstance, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the very word of God. And so it is. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, David. Well, we're going to be focusing our attention on verses 16 and 17 this morning because as we've been in the end of Ephesians in the last few weeks, we have been learning that we are in a cosmic war. There's a spiritual battle going on. The enemies that we have are not governments. Uh, they aren't our spouse. They aren't our kids. They aren't our parents. They aren't our boss at work. We have an enemy, and he is the devil, and he's evil. And he's deceptive. And as we see in our passage this morning, he doesn't just kind of sit back in his deception. He is very offensive. He uses something called the flaming dart. Does that resonate with you? Do you experience flaming darts in your life? Everyone's worried what's going to happen. Flaming darts. You know, when, when you're surfing the internet and all of a sudden that clickbait comes up and all of a sudden the darts come. Or maybe you're on social media. Maybe you're just checking out the, the latest photos from the family gathering and then all of a sudden you start clicking and clicking and you see other people and things that they happen and all of a sudden there's this thing in your heart that's like somebody else has got something I don't have. And all of a sudden it hits you. Or maybe there's something more external that happens. Maybe you encounter a phone call from the doctor. And there's a report or a trip to the hospital. And it comes unexpectedly. And, and you start to ask the question, is God, is God punishing me? Or maybe something hits your family. And all of a sudden, you learn that something's happened to your kid. And you might start to go, God, why did you let this happen? Don't you care about me? Or as some of us are experiencing more and more in our, our culture, we're as we stand for Christ in our workplaces. All of a sudden, we're told maybe we aren't going to have our job because we stand for things like God's word is infallible. God's word is authoritative. There's any number of darts that come our way. These are the flaming darts that the enemy likes to use. He loves to use them. That's why Paul says in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. God is good, but the devil wants to lie to us and say God doesn't exist. 
He wants to lie to us and say, God's not good. Like he did in the garden. Did God actually say? He wants to distract our attention from God's ultimate love for us in the gospel of Jesus Christ and say, it didn't happen. These are the various darts that just come at us. I know you resonate with some of those experiences and some of those realities, but in God's kindness, he gives us armor. He gives us armor to be able to endure the darts of the evil one. And we've been learning about some of them. We learned about some of them last week, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes for our feet, the readiness given by the gospel of peace. But he goes on, and in this verse, in verse 16, he says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. The call is for us to trust in God's character and his promises. That's what the shield of faith is, trusting in God's character and his promises. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about needing to have faith, I feel like my faith shield's about this big, right? And you're like, have faith. I'm like, I don't know. There's all these other godly Christians, and they just have great faith, but my faith is about this big. And, and, it, and it feels that way, right? Like you're trying to juke all the arrows of the evil one that are just coming with like a little thing of, of this, and you're just like... As fun as that is, like in real life, you're like, yeah, that, that's absolutely what it feels like for me. I, like we're supposed to have this faith. I, I just keep getting hit. But Paul, when he is talking about this shield, he's talking about a very different shield. The shield that the Romans had looked a bit more like this. All right? It looked a bit more like this. We can have an image of what what they look like. They're about four foot tall, about two and a half feet wide. They're made with multiple layers, often with maybe like a hide on the front of it. So when it talks about like extinguishing the flaming darts, like in battle, they would tip the darts like in oil and stuff, and they would light them on fire and they'd let them go. But this shield was so thick, oftentimes the arrows would come and they would stick in them and it would snuff out the arrows. So it was pretty common in the midst of battle for guys running around with, with their shields smoking and smoldering because arrows that had been snuffed out are stuck in the shield. But let, let us not think that we must muster up something. The shield is representing our God. If you look in the scriptures in Psalm 18, the scriptures say, God is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. It also says in Psalm 28, the Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. It's the Lord's that's our shield. It's not about our ability to navigate and manage the shield. No, we, we don't just believe, we, we trust. Faith is, isn't about trying to have this massive faith that we can, we can defend ourselves. No, faith is knowing where the shield is and running behind it, running to find refuge in it. So when the enemy's darts come, you find yourself safely behind the shield. As they come, they can come, and they can come, and they can come. And they can come. And you don't get out until you know they're done. <laughs> but that's what it means to take up the shield of faith. That's what it means. You don't have to muster something up in you to get God to accept you. And maybe if he's pleased with you, then he'll protect you from the evil one. No, he's the shield. So when illness or tragedies or persecution come and we experience doubt, and we're tempted to experience doubt, doubting his goodness, doubting the gospel, sometimes even doubting God's existence, faith believes that God is who he says he is. Faith believes God to be who he says he is. 
It's not that we muster something up. So when illness comes, Psalm 28 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield, and him my heart trusts. And I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. When tragedy strikes and we're tempted to think that God doesn't care, he's not there, he doesn't know what's going on. No, we remember in Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans that I have for you. Declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. The people of God heard that in the midst of trial and God was reminding them, no, even in the midst of the trials coming, there's something better that's coming for you. And for those of us who are found in Christ, there's something far better coming for us. When opposition comes, and we know those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. When we're, when we're tempted to think that God doesn't love us, because that's one of the darts the enemy just zings right in. At least he does in my life. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You snuff out the arrow simply by looking to the cross. Simply, we love snuffing out arrows. That's why we talk about the gospel every week here. When we gather, we talk about the gospel. Why do we have communion? We're going to have communion at the end. Because it snuffs out the, the darts of the enemy. But I know sometimes when we are engaged in this battle, it's not just like things that seem to happen on the outside, like the trials that come in. Sometimes there's like, yeah, what do I do about the things that come from my own heart? Temptations towards like sensuality or, or materialism or pride. Those don't seem to be like the, the darts of the enemy. That seems to be me. How can I be protected from those things? Because when those things happen, we are tempted to believe lies. We're tempted to be li believe lies about pleasure and love ourselves and love material things and be jealous or be critical. So many of these things. Well, even when the enemy seems like he's shooting from inside us, faith lays hold of God's word and his promises. Faith lays hold of God's word and his promises. So when temptations come, we are just reminded, God says, hey, don't covet. Don't covet this or that, your neighbor's wife. God's called you to be holy. Yet we can trust that God is good. We can trust that he is wise when he tells us those things. So when he says no, he's not saying no because he doesn't love us. He's actually saying no because he does love us. Or when we, we're more tempted to be proud, Satan's like, yeah, I know I'm, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him because I know he can be proud. And I'm going I'm to zing that right in there. And what God's word tells us, oh, God's opposed to the proud. But there's a gift here. It's not just saying, no, he gives grace to the humble. Oh, I get something from God simply by yielding to him. <sighs> Snuffing out the dart that comes. Or the mind games. Do you ever feel that? Like the... The doubt that comes and, you know, what's going on? I know what's true, but it, everything seems to be confusing up here. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything of excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. Because when you think about these things, the lies go to come and they just, they go zinging by. They go bouncing off of this. Now, I get there's a, there's a reality, there's times where we're discouraged and, and we feel like we can't even, like, get behind this. That's the beauty of being in the body of Christ. Because when we're in the body, sometimes we've got to hold this up for someone else. Have an image of like what it looked like in battle. Sometimes they, they would get together and they would put their shields side by side, and then somebody else would hold their shield up like this, and they're virtually impenetrable to flaming darts that would come. That's what happens in the body of Christ. That's why the word encourages us to encourage one another, strengthen one another, share the word with one another. Why we do all these one another's? Because they help stick our shields side by side. Not because we're mustering something up, but because we are just trusting in who God is. 
That's why it's so important for us to pursue unity in the body of Christ. Remember back in Ephesians 4? You know, we're, we're to put aside malice and wrath and gossip and slander and all that. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Paul knew the temptations that the enemy would face. Paul knew, hey, I want their shields separated. I want their, the enemy uh, is going to try to get in there. And he's like, no, we're not going to let that happen because we need one another. Because the one another's do something. They point us back to God who's firm. The one who's immovable, unshakable. The one who is our shield, who is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. That's why we need the body. We're trusting in God's character and his promises. So we're to take up the shield of faith. Now the passage goes on. He doesn't just stop at the shield. We've gotten some armor pieces, he keeps going. And he says, and take the helmet of salvation. What, what is that? That one always seems mysterious to me. Like the helmet of salvation. I kind of feel like it's something like awkward like this. What it, does this really do anything for me? I mean, it doesn't even fit in my head because I have a large head. Does this really, does this help for me? No, Paul has in view uh, a helmet that's different because he wants us to have confidence in our salvation because Roman soldiers had confidence when they had their helmets on. They, I have an image of what they look like. That's kind of what the helmets look like. They were made of iron or bronze or some combination of metal. They would put it over their head and there was often side pieces that would come down, just kind of leaving exposed your, your eyes, your nose and mouth so you could breathe, but you were protected. These helmets were were almost impenetrable. Like you needed like a, a hefty axe to get through a helmet. But they could withstand darts and even swords. So when a soldier put that on, the soldier had confidence. He's got a shield. He's got a breastplate on. He's, he's got confidence going into battle. Like the confidence that you see, maybe if you've ever seen like a, a young eight-year-old boy who, who plays football for the first time, organized football. You know, young boys, they, they love to wrestle and, you know, get at each other. But you put a helmet on a young boy, he will run through a wall because it doesn't hurt anymore. He's got confidence until he gets knocked over. And then you might not have, you know, confidence. But the, the helmet gives us Confidence. Give the soldier confidence, and the helmet is meant to give us confidence. Because Paul wanted the Ephesians to have confidence in the gospel. He wanted them to have assurance of their salvation, and he wanted them to have the confidence that that salvation brings. We are to have assurance of our salvation so that we can have confidence because our confidence can be shaken. I find that when I'm aware I've made mistakes, when I've failed as a dad or as a husband, or make mistakes as a pastor, I can be discouraged. And there are times I've said, God, am, am I really a Christian? Have you ever felt that? Have you ever asked that question when you're discouraged like the enemy's like, you're a fake. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher who was super effective, he preached to thousands of people every week when megachurches weren't a thing. His sermons were published in the local newspaper. He started a pastor's college. And he regularly would wonder if he was saved because he'd be so discouraged because the enemy wanted to lie, lie to him, to discourage him. We are a people who are forgiven. We're a people who are forgiven. Satan wants to undermine 
your confidence in your standing before God. He wants to undermine that because he knows if he undermines that, he knows you're going to be condemned and you're just going to be silent. You're not going to share the truth with other believers. You're not going to share, definitely not going to share the truth with those who don't know Christ. You will be silent. So he, he loves it when he can get at our confidence. But here's the truth, that we will celebrate as we take communion today, as we will celebrate as we reflect on what Christ did on the cross. His life was lived perfectly. Jesus' life was lived perfectly. And he went to the cross to pay the penalty for every sin every believer in Jesus ever committed. Once and for all. It was only one sacrifice that's needed. Not multiple ones every year. Once for all sin. So if you've trusted in Jesus, if you've never trusted in Jesus, that's available to you. You can surrender to Christ and have that available to you. You will not be God's enemy anymore. You will be in God's family because those who have surrendered their lives to Jesus, we are in God's family. I mean, when you look around, all these people here, they're here because of what Christ has done. We're family. Not because anyone here is like super special but because Jesus is special and he went to the cross for us. That's why Paul told the Philippians, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He wants the Christians to know God's at work and he's going to continue to work. That's why we need to remind ourselves of the gospel regularly. Numerous people over the years, it's been attributed to different people, Numerous preachers have said, preach the gospel to yourself every day. I know that kind of sounds weird. Like, what am I supposed to get in the mirror with my Bible and preach? No, it simply means remind yourself of gospel truths. There's a book called The Gospel Primer by Milton Vincent. There's a link on our resources tab on our website. That's a great resource to remind you of the gospel every day. If you're like, I don't know the Bible very well, hey, he takes a bunch of Bible verses and puts them in packageable form so you can just kind of read little devotionals each day, every day for like 30 days and remind yourself of the gospel. Because when we remind ourselves of what Christ has done, it gives us confidence that we are in Christ. It's so important for us to be reminded Remember I told you about Charles Spurgeon? He needed to be reminded. He had an awesome grandfather who, who encouraged him one day when he was discouraged. This was what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, once, when the tempter had grievously assailed me, I went to see my dear old grandfather. I told him about my terrible experience and then I wound up by saying, Grandfather, I am sure I cannot be a child of God or else I should never have such evil thoughts as these. He's discouraged. Can you resonate? Have you experienced that? But his grandfather's awesome. He goes, Nonsense, Charles. Answered the good old man. It's just because you are a Christian that you are tempted. These blasphemies are no children of yours. They are the devil's brats, which he delights to lay at the door of a Christian. Don't you own them as yours. Give them neither house room or heart room. What an awesome grandfather. Reminds him of the truth of the gospel. Those aren't yours. Yeah, you have an enemy. So when the enemy comes to tempt you or shoot the fiery darts, you just simply say, I'm guilty, but I've been saved from sin's penalty because of what Jesus has done. Yeah, I feel that affliction, but I am being saved from sin's power, which comes to try to afflict me. I, I may be discouraged at times, but I know that there's going to come a day when all this is gone. Remember last week we talked about the already and not yet, like we're, we are experiencing now the benefits of the gospel, 
But yet on the last day, when we see Jesus face to face, this battle is done. No more darts flying. No more need for the armor. We don't need to be reminded because we're going to be in the presence of Jesus. So when the enemy comes, we simply remind him of the truth. I'm redeemed. You're forgiven. You're reconciled. The Bible says we're raised with Christ. We're seated with Christ. Have confidence because of what Christ has done. It is true. It is finished. If you've surrendered your life to him, nothing can snatch you out of the Father's hand. Jesus was praying for you in the garden, praying for all those who God gave him. He was praying for you before you even took a breath. He's interceding for you right now. So we have confidence in our salvation. And then he gives us a weapon. Go back at your Bibles and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We fight with the truth of God's Word. Now a sword, and they didn't really look like this with these fancy things. They were about this size. They the armor that a Roman soldier would have, but, but the sword was sharp on two sides. It was heavy enough to be able to deal a deathly blow, but it was also light enough so that they could be limber in the midst of battle because it's hand-to-hand -hand battle. They're right on it. There's days we feel like the devil's just breathing on us. And this was both an offensive weapon and a defensive weapon. If someone came at, they could stop. And we are given not a physical sword. We are given the word of God. As we learned in the Committed series, these words are breathed out by God. This isn't just a book. This isn't a novel that might be clever. No, these words were produced by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1 tells us, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. These are God's words. And they're so powerful, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 4.12, says this, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the divisions of soul and of spirit and joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So God's word isn't just some big old sword to kind of lump and whack at things. Actually, God's word is so powerful. It can get right to the, the one thing in your heart. Like a, like a surgeon's scalpel that just goes to the, the, the one place where where surgery needs to happen. That's what God's word is. Even Jesus needed to use God's word in the midst of this cosmic battle. Maybe you remember in Luke chapter 4, after Jesus had been fasting for 40 days in the wilderness, and he encounters Satan. And and Jesus responds to Satan's temptations by quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. It starts with, with Satan saying, oh, hey, command these stones to be bread. Because he knew he was a bit hungry after not eating for 40 days. And Jesus replies and says, man shall not live by bread alone. That's what's written. Satan goes on. He tries to, to tempt him to, to get the praise of, of men. And Jesus says, no, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then, then Satan, he's such a deceiver. He actually takes God's words from the Psalms and tries to say, oh, hey, Jesus, why don't you jump off this cliff? The angels are going to catch you. The Bible says so. But because Jesus spent so much time with his father, he knew his Old Testament because the Old Testament was Jesus' Bible. 
That's why we value the Old Testament, not just the New Testament. That was Jesus' Bible. And Jesus says, no, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. See, Jesus didn't need to go at Satan. No, just, he comes. That's how powerful God's word is. Brothers and sisters, we don't have to get ourselves all worked up. Like, okay, I gotta, I gotta memorize all these passages of scripture because if I don't memorize this many, then I'm just gonna be open and I'm not gonna be able to fight. Yeah, the more that we learn, I believe the more confident that we are but we just need one passage. We just need to claim the name of Jesus because we're found in him. God's word is powerful. So we need to ask ourselves, what keeps us from engaging God's word? What keeps you from taking advantage of, of this sword. Because we live in a day, I'm just going to call out the elephant in the room. We live in a day where images just come at us. I don't know about you, I find it so much easier to reach over the top of my Bible to the remote control and turn it on. Do you, do you find that ease of use? Like when I was a kid, I don't know, young kids, you don't get what this is. Like we actually had to get up off the couch and go and turn. It's just so, it's just so much easier to do that. It's, it's so much easier to just get out the phone and just kind of scroll, see things, images. It, it is. I, I feel that. We have to understand God didn't reveal himself in images. I think God uses images, certainly. When we see his creation, we can see that God exists. We're without excuse. How did God reveal himself? By his word. By speaking his word. That's how he engages with his creation. That's how creation came to be, through his word. Why was Jesus the image of the invisible God? Because he was the word became flesh who dwelt among us. God engages with us with his word. And we have to push back. That doesn't mean we don't ever look at images or we can't ever watch a movie or we can't ever read an article online. That's not the point. But we have to understand our God isn't high above on a mountain somewhere going, hey, why don't you come find me? Maybe you'll find me one day. Maybe you'll die trying. No, he came in the flesh. He's revealed himself to us. We live in a day of literacy where we actually can read and we can have our own copy of the scriptures. The God of the universe says, I want to speak to you. I have things to say to you. So when we talk about studying God's word and reading God's word, it's not something we're encouraging you to do so that you can earn brownie points with God. That's not the purpose of, of time in his word. The purpose of time in his word is when you open it and you read these things, God speaks to you. God speaks to you. That's why we would memorize this book. That's why we would meditate on this book. And and saints of old understood this. One saint in particular, his name's Hudson Taylor, he founded the China Inland Mission, taking the gospel to Asia. They didn't live in the day where you can just hop on a plane and get somewhere with the conveniences and comforts that we have, but they conquered immense hardships by time in God's word. Dr. and Mrs. Howard Taylor record this in his biography. This is what they say. It was not easy for Mr. Taylor in his changeful life to make time for prayer and Bible study. 
He was busy. They were hard. It was hard. But he knew it was vital. Well do the writers remember traveling with him month after month in northern China. By cart and wheelbarrow. With the poorest of inns at night. So hard conditions. Often they would go someplace, they would, would only have one large room for everyone, all the travelers, to be together. They would screen off a corner for their father and another, maybe for themselves, with a curtain. And then after, sleep. At last, a measure of quiet would come. And as it was quiet, you might hear the striking of a match if it works like that. And a candle would be lit and it would flicker. So when they would hear the match strike and they'd see the flicker of candlelight, which told that Mr. Taylor however weary he was, was poring over the Bible that he had in two volumes, always at hand, from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. That was a time he usually gave to prayer, the time he could be most sure of being undisturbed to wait upon God. Now, I'm not saying... That, that you must do your Bible time from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. Because I get it. Like, I'm going to St. Mattress between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. And I like to get up early. But Hudson Taylor understood something. He understood how essential this book was because these are God's very words. How essential they were to the battles that he was fighting. The battles for souls and that the trials and tribulations and the things that would come, the fiery darts that would come in. He knew that the truth that's discovered here would embolden his faith and those darts would stick and they would snuff out. He knew that they would chink off his helmet because he knew he was found in Christ because he spent time with Jesus. That's why we spend time in his word. That's why we pray over his word. That's why we proclaim the word. We proclaim the word. Why? Because we have the keys to set those who are in bondage free. The enemy is lying to everyone. Not just lying to those who are sitting here and those who are called Christians. He's lying to everyone. They're bound in chains because they're believing lies. They don't know how to get out. And we have the keys. We have the keys to unlock the chains. That's why we value God's word. But again, the call isn't for us to, to gird up so that we can charge. Look at verse 13. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. To stand firm. That's the call. We're standing firm because he's given us the armor. This is not the first time in the scriptures that we see God's people standing firm. You remember David and Goliath, right? Pretty familiar story. Nobody knows how it ends. But as David, this, this young boy, is, is faced with encountering this, this giant of a Philistine who is cursing God, King Saul goes, hey, put on this armor. So there's armor in the story. But it's human armor. It's physical armor. He's like, ah, it doesn't fit. That's not really going to help me anyway. Yes, he had the ability to use a slingshot. He had, he had fought wild beasts in protecting the sheep as a shepherd. But he's facing a formidable foe. But how does David 
interact with this foe. He trusts in who God is. I'm going to read to you 1 Samuel 17. This is his interaction. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. You feel those in your life? You feel those swords and spears and fiery darts? But I come to you. He doesn't go, I come to you uh, in my own strength. I've memorized all these Bible passages. I'm a really good guy. I've done all this kind of stuff. No, nope. this is what he says. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and I will cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. What was true then is true now for God's people. If you have trusted in Christ and surrendered your life to him, you don't have to muster anything up. And just run to him and be firm because you're found in Christ, your head's protected. The vital organs are protected because you don't have to earn something with God, but you don't have a righteousness of your own. You have the righteousness that's been given to you because Jesus lived perfectly when you couldn't. When the enemy's darts come, and they come, and they're going to come before you leave here today, they're going to come this afternoon. We take up the shield of faith. We simply believe who God says he is and he's going to continue to tell us who he is. He's going to show us his goodness, remind us of the gospel so we can have confidence in him as we engage in the spiritual battles that we face. And we'll do it together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us the armor But right now, I want to just give us the opportunity to respond. Right where you are, uh, you don't have to open your eyes. Don't open your eyes. Just where you are, come before God and thank him for the gift of this armor to protect you. Even if you feel like you don't know how to navigate it, like your God loves you and he protects you. Just come and just thank him. Thank him for a way that he has protected you against the schemes of the evil one. Some of you, you're going to thank him just that you showed up this morning because you were tempted not to. Just thank him, just right where you are. And maybe you're in a place where you need to come and just confess. You've, you've doubted. You've tried to do things in your own strength. You've picked up the tiny shield and you just tried to muscle it out and you're confused. Why does it keep coming? Just confess to him. God doesn't say, nope, you, you, I'm taking all this away. I only, I only one offer. Nope, that's not how it works. Just come, and if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. So just come, confess fear. Confess unbelief. And know that you're forgiven. And let's ask God. You know the spiritual battles that are raising, raging. Pray for God's help. Pray for wisdom. Pray right now for those you know who are just getting pummeled by the darts of the evil one. They're discouraged and, and they've dropped the shield and they, they're, dis, they're despondent. Or maybe those that have never come to Christ, they're in bondage. Let's just take a few moments right where you're at. Pray for those people. Pray for them by name. Father, we yield to you. Lord, this armor is yours. You give it to us because you love us. You know that the battle rages and we are going to have to live in it and experience it until you bring us home or until we see Jesus face to face. But 
we thank you, God, and we yield to you in this manner, and we trust you. We run to you and find refuge in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.